Let's pray. Lord God, I ask that you prepare our hearts for your message. I ask that you let the, the meditations of my heart and the words of my mouth be pleasing unto you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, welcome to week six of our journey through the story. Now, for some of you who might need to catch up, the story is a chronological telling or recap of the Bible to give you a sense of how God uses the lower story of our lives here on earth to fulfill the upper story that God has written as the plan for our redemption. The story is presented in five movements, five movements and the first movement of this story told us the story of God in the beginning before creation itself. Then through the Garden of Eden, the fall, the flood, the Tower of Babel. The, st the story describes the first movement as the story of the garden where Adam and Eve rejected the vision of God and so were cast out of the garden. But God started a plan then to get us back, to restore us to the garden. So far in the second movement of the story, the story of Israel, we have learned of the covenant with Abraham to make a nation of him through his son Isaac, whom Abraham was willing to sacrifice. Through Isaac's son Jacob, also known as Israel, we learned how God's providence turned the evil intended towards Jacob's son Joseph into a haven for Joseph's family during a devastating seven-year famine. But that haven turned into a prison of slavery and oppression. And after over 400 years, the Lord sent Moses to bring his deliverance to the people from Egypt. And shortly after their deliverance, God gives the people rules to live by in relation to both God himself and to each other. And we pick up the story as the people of Israel, who've been on the road for a while, as they approach the promised land. The land promised to Abraham over 600 years earlier, and it's just over the Jordan River. One, man, one night, a, a man was driving home near Ottawa. He was on a road he was very familiar with, and as he came to a stop sign, he, he slowed down, but he didn't come to a complete stop, whereupon a police officer pulled him over. What difference does it make if I, if I slow down or stop, he said to the police officer. The police officer said, well, let me make you a demonstration. He pulled out his nightstick and started to beat the guy with it. And he said, tell me, do you want me to slow down or do you want me to stop? Now, turn to your neighbor and tell them if you're the person who comes to a complete stop at every stop sign or somebody who rolls through. And remember, it's not good to lie in church. Go ahead. I'll give you a second. We can get into... We get into so much trouble on the road when we're not paying attention. We get into trouble when we, won't, when we don't obey the rules. And now, turn to your neighbor and tell them about the last time you got a ticket. All right. So if you're one of those, like some people, who've never gotten a ticket or can't remember the last time they got a ticket because it's been so long, well, phooey on you. Now, the last time I got a ticket, it wasn't, it wasn't a real good story, except for the fact that it was in Italy. But there was no police officer, and I blame... I blame the language barrier. I'm, my Italian is not great, okay? And some of the signs were hard to understand. So six months after we got home, I got a ticket in the mail. That's not very exciting. However, my lovely wife 
has a different story that she's allowed me to share with you. The year is 1995. <laughs> it's the day before Thanksgiving, and Lynette's older son is really excited about a program that's going to be on television. This was before DVR, right? Before you could record stuff and watch it whenever you wanted, right? She got pulled over doing 80 in a 55. <laughs> now, now, you know they can just take your license from you right then when you're doing over 25 miles an hour with speed limit, right? Well, this police officer was very kind and, and just gave her a ticket and didn't impound the car or nothing, let her go on home with the, with the kids in the car, you know. But it did, she did have to go to bad driver's school. Yeah, there were consequences to that ticket. Israel's road trip began with Abraham, a man called to hit the road without a clear notion of where his destination was going to be until the Lord showed it to him, a land that would flow with milk and honey. But even then, he wasn't to take possession of it quite yet. But now Israel is about to get themselves into some trouble They've been following their GPS, their God positioning system. You know, the cloud they've been following. Moses is in the driver's seat with the children of Israel in the back seat. They are driving out of Egypt and out of slavery across the Red Sea through the desert of Sinai, and they have come to a city called Kadesh Barnea. Now, if you've ever been on a road trip with kids, you know that sometimes they can get a little unruly, a little impatient. I'm hungry. I'm thirsty. Are we there yet? Why don't we just go home? Well, Moses had to deal with all of this for thousands of kids, tens of thousands. I imagine he was relieved when he finally reached Kadesh Barnea and was able to turn around from the driver's seat and say, hey, we're almost here, okay? Get out and stretch your legs while I send some folks out to scout the way. Now, that's, by the way, a common tactic for, for any military movement, right? You send people ahead to check the route. The Lord speaks to Moses in, in Numbers chapter 13, verses 1 and 2. Send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which, I'm a, which I am giving to the Israelites. From each ancestral tribe, send one of its leaders. And continuing in the book of Numbers, it's revealed that the 12 were gone for 40 days. And when they reported back, they tell Moses, hey, the land is awesome. And it is truly flowing with milk and honey. As a matter of fact, they brought back a, a cluster of grapes that was so plump it took two men to carry it back with them. That's, that's why we have grapes on our bulletin cover this morning. But, they said, we have a problem. There are people already living there, and they're, and they're quite like it there. They're pretty happy there. And there are a lot of them. And some of them are giants. There is no way that we can take that land from them. They are too strong. Then Caleb, who was one of the 12 spies, speaks up. He silenced the people before Moses and said, We should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. Ten other spies spread a bad report through the people. Only Joshua, the last of the 12, stood with Caleb. They tore their clothes and said to the entire assembly, let me read it to you. The land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and will give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord, and do not be afraid of the people of the land, because we will devour them. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. And how do you suppose the assembly responded? They talked about stoning these guys, picking a new driver, and returning back to Egypt. That is where they made the wrong turn. After all they'd been through, after Passover deliverance from ten plagues, 
after the Red Sea experience, after the, the manna from heaven, that supernatural provision for them, after getting water from the rock to satisfy their thirst, their lack of, of trust, their rebellion, causes God to again consider starting all over with Moses. And again, Moses intercedes for the people. So instead, God recalculates their route. You've seen that, right? God gives Moses a message for the people. So tell them, as surely as I live, declares the Lord, I will do to you the very thing I heard you say. In this wilderness, your bodies will fall. Every one of you, 20 years old or more, who was counted in the census and who has grumbled against me, not one of you will enter the land I swore with uplifted hand to make your home, except Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, son of Nun. As for your children that you said would be taken as plunder, I will bring them in to enjoy the land you have rejected. But as for you... Your bodies will fall in this wilderness. Your children will be shepherds here for 40 years, suffering for your unfaithfulness until the last of your bodies lies in the wilderness. For 40 years, one year for each of the 40 days you explored the land, you will suffer for your sins and know what it is like to have me against you. And so began the wandering of the children of Israel. But we've all made wrong turns though, right? All of us. I remember one time we were coming back from, from Denver on the way to Des Moines. And I'm pretty sure that we'd uh, gotten on Interstate 80 by this time, headed east. And uh, it's time for me to take a nap. So we pull off the road. It, we got a little bit of snow, not too bad, a little bit of snow. And we pull off, and, and Lynette and I switch drivers. And so I get in the passenger seat, and I immediately grab the pillow and settle in. Lynette takes us up on the road, and, and for some reason, just a little bit later, I open my eyes, and I see that the snow that used to be blowing one direction across the road is now blowing the other direction across the road. And I say, Lynette, which way are we headed? And unfortunately, she had gotten on the highway the wrong way, headed back to Denver. Fortunately, we had not gone too far. And yes, I did get permission to share that story too. In that case, it was pretty easy to get back going in the right direction. But have you wandered like Israel did? I have. I was sort of raised in the church. But I didn't have any great relationship role models growing up. I knew right from wrong, but it didn't always keep me from doing wrong. One wrong led to another and another. Then about 30 years ago, I started being unfaithful to my wife. For a minute, I felt remorse. I even went back to church briefly because we hadn't been going. But when God didn't give me the help I expected, I rebelled. I blamed God for my weakness. And I didn't just wander. I ran. I ran from God. For years, I had not been doing the things that would help me follow where God wanted to lead me. And then I got mad at God for my inability to follow. I never opened my map. I never talked to people who were on the same trip that I was to, to learn from them and get some direction or maintenance tips. I turned off my GPS. You get the idea. For almost 15 years, I did my own thing. And it led nowhere good. After my second ill-fated marriage fell apart, I looked in the mirror and didn't much like what I saw. 
I give credit to the Holy Spirit for giving me that filter to look through because it got me back into church, albeit slowly. But God is patient. God is faithful to forgive our sins when we confess them. God did not forget his promise to Abraham. His descendants would return to the promised land. But how much trouble could the Israelites have saved themselves if they had just remained faithful? How much different would their children's lives have been if they had just remained faithful? I have wondered that of my own life and my children's lives. We can We, too, can become complacent in our lives. We can get caught up in sin and have hard hearts. And if we allow this to happen, then we will be left wandering. There's an old saying, those who fail to learn from the past are doomed to repeat it. And perhaps that's why the writer of the book of Hebrews takes the time to to give his readers a history lesson which at the time was more than a thousand years old, and and that's also why today, over two thousand years later, this lesson still needs to be told. Therefore, holy brothers and sisters who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts upon Jesus, whom we acknowledge as our apostle and high priest. Moses was faithful as a servant in all God's house, bearing witness to what would be spoken by God in the future. But Christ is faithful as the Son over God's house. And we are his house, if indeed we hold firmly to our confidence and the hope in which we glory. Hebrews chapter 3 goes on, See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the very end. As has just been said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. What do all the following men have in common? Jacob, Samson, David, Peter, Paul, Kelly. They are all men who love God deeply, but who wandered away from God at various times in their lives and had to be restored in fellowship with God. And I'd be really surprised if we couldn't add your name to that list as well. That's because it's the nature of sheep to wander away from the shepherd. As Robert Robinson put in the hymn, Come Thou Font of Every Blessing, Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. I think if we're honest, what most of us would really like from God is to have him give us a complete roadmap of the life he has planned for us, not just the destination. Instead, he just gives us the next direction, and we need to remain on the right path. If we knew every step and detail of our lives, there'd be no need for faith in God. That's why the writer of Proverbs penned these familiar words. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. God does not promise to lead us on paths of prosperity or popularity or comfort or even happiness. He promises to lead us in the paths of righteousness for his glory. God promises that he will provide for us that he will restore our souls, and that we will be able to enter his rest. We must learn to trust wholeheartedly in the leadership of the shepherd, the good shepherd, Jesus Christ. We must learn to obey the parts of God's will that, that we already know and have been revealed to us. We need to have no fear to follow where God 
is leading us. If there is a new place you must go, God will provide a way. If there is a battle to be fought, have faith in the Lord that you will be equipped to win it. Don't forget what the Lord has done for you already like the Israelites did. The Lord is my shepherd. Jesus is the good shepherd. Learn to know his voice and follow him. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, as we have sung today, lead us, guide us. Draw back those who are wandering today. Draw them back to follow you. Draw them back into fellowship with their brothers and sisters in Christ so that we can all edify and encourage one another as your word has taught us to do. We thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen.